Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to cover a few things this afternoon. First, how the, the most recent farm performance estimates compare with previous years, and what happened to the financial performance of producers. We'll have a fairly close look at farm debt. And in the second part of my talk, I'll look at trends and sources of past productivity growth and whether they can be expected to drive future growth. One of the main challenges for the sector will be maintaining competit competitiveness through productivity improvements that are increasingly challenging to achieve. So to farm performance. Farm cash income is expected to remain relatively high in 2012-13 for most broad acre farms. You can see that average farm incomes increased sharply in 2010-11 and remained high in 11-12. Above average rainfall resulted in increased pro crop production and livestock production, and that increase combined with high sheep and lamb prices to give us a strong outcome. 2012-13 has been drier, which has resulted in reduced grain production, but led to greater livestock turnoff. Overall higher prices for crops are expected to largely offset the lower crop production. On the other hand, Increased livestock turnoff is expected to be offset by lower prices. Broad acre farm cash income is projected to average $100,000 a farm in 2012 13. Although that's lower than the $109,000 achieved in 11 12, it's more than 20% above the average for the previous 10 years. The story for dairy is quite different. You can see that average dairy farm cash income is expected to fall from $143,000 last year to $95,000 a farm in 2012-13, slightly below the average for the previous 10 years. This substantial decline is due to a reduction in average milk prices and higher farm expenditure, mainly increased purchase of fodder. There's a fair bit of variation across the states but in all cases, incomes are down in 2012-13. There'll be more specific industry detail on farm performance in the individual commodity sessions tomorrow morning and tomorrow afternoon. Now what I've been presenting here are farm, uh, per farm averages. But as you'd be aware, there's a wide variation across farms, so it's useful to think about that for a minute. Here, broadacre farm businesses have been allocated to top, middle, and bottom performing categories on the basis of their rate of return to capital. You can see that farm cash income is substantially higher for the top 25% of farms. Including capital appreciation, they also had an average annual rate of return of nearly 10%, compared with 4% for all broadacre farms over the last 20 years. Now this superior financial performance is a result of many factors, including differences in the scale of the farm, land quality, and the quality of management. Top performing farms dominate new investment in the broadacre sector, accounting for 65% of net capital additions in the last three years. In contrast, the middle 50% accounted for only a quarter of net capital additions. Top performing farms also account for the bulk of the value of production, accounting for more than half of the value of, half of the total value of broad acre production in the last three years. Now relatively high rates of new investment for top performers are likely to support the generation of further productivity gains to increase farm production and maintain incomes over the longer term. So we can probably expect to see the gap between the top performers and the others to continue to widen. Now I just want to look quickly at farm debt. You hear, it about, you hear about it a lot, usually in a negative context, so it's useful to understand the trends and what it's being used for. Average debt per farm business more than doubled in real terms for broad acre farms between the year 2000 and 2006-07 to $527,000 per farm. Debt for dairy farms increased even faster and continued to increase until 2008-09 when it reached $739,000 per farm. Lower interest rates 
increases in farm size and land prices, and reduced farm incomes due to drought all contributed. Growth in farm debt has slowed recently with more restricted access to credit and a lower appetite from farm businesses for debt. The largest contribution to farm debt in the last, in the last decade has been borrowing to fund new investment, especially the purchase of land. While not as large as the debt to fund working capital, the purchase of machinery, plant and vehicles has also been important. Debt to finance on-farm investment has been central to facilitating some of the significant structural adjustment we've seen and can be expected to contribute to future productivity growth. This is the growth in the main three types of debt for Broadacre Farms. You can see that debt to fund land purchase and working capital has grown significantly. Increasing farm size resulted in higher borrowing for ongoing working capital, as has a move away from less intensive wool production into more intensive cropping. And of course, borrowing to meet working capital requirements also increased during the recent drought. A big change has been the investment in machinery, plant and vehicles with a shift into cropping. For dairy farms, we see that the three types of debt increased at about the same rate for most of that period. Much of the increase in working capital debt is linked to increases in the scale and intensity of dairy operations. So how have these increases in borrowing affected the financial position of producers? You can see that the proportion of receipts needed to fund interest payments the debt servicing ratio, did increase substantially before levelling out more recently and currently sits at around 8%. Despite the large increases in debt, farm equity ratios were largely maintained through the late 90s and 2000s by large increases in land value. In the period since 2008, when debt has started to level out, land values have generally not increased and are reported to have declined in some regions, Northern, Extra Northern Australia being one example. In general, farmers seem reasonably positioned both in terms of their overall equity levels and their ability to service debt. Importantly, much of the debt has been used to fund expansion and increase intensity, both of which would be expected to have payoffs in the longer term. Now onto productivity. In the, in the long term, we know that productivity growth underpins the financial performance of the industry. There's little we can do to influence prices, but productivity growth is something we can affect. Our estimates of productivity growth for the, for the broad acre and dairy industries indicate that over the last 33 years, productivity growth's been variable. Growth in the broad acre sector has averaged 1% a year, while growth in dairy has averaged 1.6% a year. As has been widely discussed, growth in broadacre productivity has also slowed after over the last 10 to 15 years, as has growth for the, for the sector overall. Up until 92, 93, broadacre productivity averaged 1.8% a year, but this has declined to 0.2% from then on. Now that recent slowdown is primarily due to a run of poor seasons, which has caused a substantial fall in, in output in all broadacre industries. But from a long-term perspective, agriculture has done reasonably well in maintaining productivity growth. Here we have the results of a recent collaboration between ABARES and equivalent agencies in the US and Canada that looked at relative productivity in each country using an internationally consistent and comparable data set. This is a much longer time series than the slides we were just looking at. It goes back to 1961, but the recent history is very similar. Importantly, in this graph, productivity levels can be compared across countries. As you can see, Australia had lower agricultural productivity than Canada and the US, likely in large part because of inherent comparative advantages of those two countries in terms of climate, soil quality, size, location, and so on. 
But you can also see that over the long term, growth in Australia has just about kept pace with the US and in growth terms, we've outperformed Canada. Now, while there has been a slowdown in productivity growth in Australia, this is not the case in either Canada or the US. But even with the recent slowdown, we've been successful in maintaining productivity and competitiveness against these key competitors. Sustaining this position over the next five decades might be more challenging. High input costs and environmental pressures associated with land, water, biodiversity and climate change may constrain agricultural productivity improvements. And improvements that have yielded productivity gains in the past may have less potential to generate growth in the future. Long-term growth is fundamentally underpinned by improvements in farm technologies and practices. And there are many well-known examples of these. Technological change, combined with changes in the operating environment and a range of other drivers, have been the catalyst for substantial structural adjustment that has contributed to productivity growth. Over the last 30 years, consolidation and growth in average farm size has allowed farms to, to achieve efficiencies of size, meaning they can adopt technologies not feasible at a smaller scale. Cropping machinery is an example of this. Advanced dairy shed technologies are another. Larger farm scale also improves the capacity of farms to finance and implement better technologies and farm practices. There's a question as to whether the drivers that have underpinned productivity growth in the past will continue to contribute to the same degree. There are a number of reasons to think this might be challenging. First, Australian agriculture has benefited from wide-ranging microeconomic reforms introduced throughout the 80s and 90s, in particular phasing out of price supports and marketing schemes in industries such as dairy and wool and the removal of trade barriers. This increased the incentive for innovation and certainly played a role in spurring the structural changes that have occurred over the last 30 years. In many ways, the areas that were of most importance to agriculture have been tackled. And it's hard to see that the future, that future microeconomic reforms would drive the, si the same kinds of change. In that sense, there may be less potential for productivity benefits through the structural adjustments that occur in response to microeconomic reform. And secondly, it may be the case that to a large extent, the benefits of technologies currently available to cropping industries have been realised. There's evidence that producers in these industries are relative, operate relatively efficiently and that the available technologies have been widely adopted. Cropping supported broadacre productivity growth in the 80s and 90s, but it's not clear it can continue to do so without significant advances in technologies. So the upshot is that future productivity gains are likely to depend heavily on the development of new technologies, such as plant and animal genetics, enabling information technologies, and water-saving technologies, to name a few. So to conclude, in the long term, our international competitiveness will be largely determined by the extent to which we can improve productivity. We've maintained productivity and competitiveness against key competitors, but sustaining this might be challenging. Now, there's a role for government in fostering productivity growth. It can facilitate efficient domestic R&D that will lead to further advances in technology. And it can do this by ensuring that public funding is efficiently allocated by removing legal and regula regulatory disincentives to private R&D, and of course by, suppo by supporting research capacity in the education arena. It can also avoid adding to the constraints that farmers now face around natural resources by adopting flexible and efficient forms of regulation where regulation is required. This is especially relevant to environmental regulation where flexible options and the use of market mechanisms can assist to, to minimise the overall cost of environmental management. And in general, government can continue to pursue wider, wider economic reform around infrastructure, labour regulation and taxation. 
To borrow from Gary Banks of the Productivity Commission, there's no silver bullet that can solve Australia's productivity challenges. The development of technologies to underpin productivity growth will require a sustained effort, and that needs to be supported by ongoing pursuit of productivity-enhancing reforms. Thank you. Thank you.